So uh, welcome everyone to the speaker program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I'm Catherine Wilhelm, the executive director. We invite speakers from around the world to share their expertise on a wide range of legal matters that involve Asia, Asian law, and international law in Asia. Today, we are taking a deep dive into an international convention that was designed to resolve transnational disputes about child custody. The 1980 Hague Convention on the Aspects of National Child Abduction is now in force in more than 100 countries which makes it among the more successful international private law conventions in terms of states joining. But that doesn't mean that everything has been entirely smooth sailing for the convention. Child custody is part of family law, and it's difficult to think of an area of law that is more deeply linked to culture than family law. Our speaker, uh, Yuko Nishitani, who is a professor of law at Kyoto University in Japan, has written about some of the difficulties faced by Japan and uh, a few other Asian countries in accepting the fundamental premises of the Child Abduction Convention. And she's with us here to explain. Professor Nishitani teaches international private and business law at Kyoto University. I was fortunate to meet her last spring when she was a global professor at NYU School of Law. She's extremely accomplished in the area of private law, so I'll only mention a few highlights from her resume. You can find more on our website. She is a titular member of the International Academy of Comparative Law and was a director of studies and lecturer at the Hague Academy of International Law. She has been its vice president since this past May, 2023, so congratulations. Uh, she has served on several legislative committees in Japan and represented the Japanese government at the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Uh, Professor Nishitani contributed a chapter to a recently published book, The Research Handbook on International Child Abduction, the 1980 Hague Convention, uh, edited by Marilyn Freeman and Nicola Taylor. And so for a limited time, we have posted Professor Nishitani's chapter at our website. Uh, please look if you haven't yet. The entire book uh, with about a dozen contributors is really worth a read. And also with us today is Linda Silberman, who will discuss implementation of the convention in the United States. She is the Clarence D. Ashley Professor of Law Emerita at NYU School of Law. She has written uh, over a wide range of domestic and transnational legal topics, including conflict of laws, domestic and comparative procedure, transnational litigation, international arbitration, and international child abduction. She's a member of the U.S. State Department's Advisory Committee on Private International Law and has been a member of several State Department delegations to the Hague Conference on Private International Law, focusing on cross-border family law issues. So now I want to invite Professor Nishitani to make some opening remarks, uh, and she'll be followed by Professor Thank you very much, Catherine and Bruce, for your uh, warm and kind invitation to give um, a talk at this uh, event. And thank you also, on, uh, Linda, for uh, joining us. You're such an expert in this field, and it's a great honor and pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss these issues with you. So uh, I'd like to introduce how Japan joined the Hague Child Abduction Convention in 2014 and uh, what kind of challenges we have had um, in uh, doing that. So in a typical case, a Japanese mother married to a U.S. husband uh, lived in the United States. And when they encounter some marital difficulties and marriage breaks down, then the Japanese mother often took the child uh, back to Japan to escape from the difficulties in the United States or perhaps domestic violence of the husband. And uh, um, this caused a lot of difficulties because from the perspective of the U.S. husband, suddenly the wife and the children disappeared and they went back to Japan and uh, it was no longer possible for the U.S. father to have uh, access to the child. So U.S. fathers tried hard to get the children back 
but um, they remained um, unsuccessful. So from 1994 until 2011, there were 230 cases of child abduction from the United States to Japan, and no single child has been returned. And this kind of acts, and uh, the mother takes the child and uh, go, goes back to Japan without the father's consent, is an illegal acts and illegal child abduction. But um, and it was not possible under the Japanese domestic law to get the children back. So from around 2010, uh, the US and Canada and France uh, started to urge Japan to join the Hague Child Abduction Convention to ensure return of illegally abducted children. So the Hague Convention and is a very efficient mechanism to ensure return of children wrongfully removed or retained in another contracting state. So when there are two contracting states, like the United States and for example, another contracting state, and the child is abducted from the US to another contracting state, then the convention ensures that the child be promptly returned and uh, without going uh, into the custody issues on the merits and uh, the access of the child and um, with the left behind parents be ensured under the convention. And the child abduction convention ensures best interest of the child by ensuring prompt return of the child to the state of habitual residence. And it builds a cooperation mechanism between the contracting states. So every contracting state appoints a central authority. And once a child is abducted from one contracting state to another, then central authorities exchange information and uh, help the parents to have access to the child and to find out where about the children so that the children can be promptly returned to the state of habitual residence. And uh, the Child Abduction Convention um, guarantees the rights of the child, uh, protecting the UN Convention of the rights of the child to um, maintain the personal relations of the child and direct conduct with both parents, also in the case of child abduction. The Hague Convention um, grants also limited grounds for refusal because, for example, there is a great risk for the child to be returned um, to the state of habitual residence. Then, ex in exceptional circumstances, the return of the child can be refused. And this is also the case when the child is mature, like over 10 years old, and the child refuses to be re being returned then again, the return of the child can be refused under exceptional circumstances. And this mechanism of the Hague Convention is uh, very successful. So it has gained 103 contracting states so far. And from Asia, China, unfortunately not mainland China, but only Hong Kong and Macau so far, and Sri Lanka, Thailand, Singapore, South Korea, the Philippines and Pakistan are also member states. And several other Asian countries like India, Indonesia and Vietnam are also contemplating to join the convention. So uh, although it was obvious that the Hague Convention is so efficient and so uh, successful, it took Japan for almost a decade to decide to join the convention. So there are uh, specific reasons for that. So first of all, Japanese family law is very traditional and uh, there is no clear notion of rights or obligations under Japanese family law. So once a marriage breaks down and the mother takes the child to go back to her parents' home, then it is actually legal and accepted under Japanese domestic law. So it was hard for us to accept the basic concept of the Child Abduction Convention that taking the child away and going back to the home country for the mother uh, constitutes a wrongful act. And in Japanese family law, state does not intervene so often. So divorce is mainly based on concept between the parents. So consensual divorce constitutes almost 90% of all divorce cases in Japan. And once um, divorce is agreed upon by the uh, spouses, they also determine who shall have the um, custody rights uh, over the child after divorce and how uh, child support and uh, uh, access to the child shall uh, take place. And they are based on agreement between the spouses. And once uh, the divorce uh, occurs, then the um, house is separated, so to say, between two parties, and there is no nothing remaining between them. 
in principles. So this is why uh, we do not have yet joint parental authority after divorce, but only one parent obtains parental authority and custody over the child. So all this um, background um, made it very difficult for Japan to join the Hague Convention. However, um, due to diplomatic pressure and also the considerations made by the Japanese government, the con perception of the Japanese society gradually changed as well. So first of all, we realized that Japan should abide by the international standards set forth by the Hague Convention because of our 100 states are contracting states. So we, as one of the G7 countries, should also join the convention. And um, secondly, uh, the Japanese government realized that there are not only incoming cases where children are abducted to, to Japan, but also outgoing cases that children are abducted from Japan to a foreign country. And in order to get the children back to Japan, actually the Hague Convention is very helpful for us as well. And uh, ultimately, the Japanese government realized that Japanese mothers are being disadvantaged just because Japan was not yet a member state of the Hague Convention. So Japanese mothers living in the United States or in Canada uh, should have been able to obtain joint parental responsibility after divorce in the usual case. But courts started to refuse to give custody rights to the Japanese mother for fear of losing the child just because Japan was not yet a member state of the Child Abduction Convention. So there was no way of guaranteeing the return of the children back to these countries once the Japanese mother takes the child out of their jurisdiction. So that's why Japanese mothers could not obtain custody rights or relocation order, uh, which would have been the case with other parents in, in such case. So Japanese government realized it's actually advantageous for Japan to join the Hay Convention. So, so that's how uh, they finally decided to join the convention in 2014. After we joined the Hague Convention, I think we, we had to do a lot of work <laughs> to implement the convention properly. So first of all, we set up our central authority at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it was a big issue whether the Ministry of Justice should do that or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Ministry of Justice is actually more suitable because they are legal experts, but they are not exposed to foreign countries and negotiations with foreign parents and so on. So they had concern of using English for that purpose. So that's why ultimately the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, is uh, appointed as a central authority in Japan. In order to guarantee a prompt return of children, we also needed to implement new return proceedings for court. So we uh, concentrated the jurisdiction on the Tokyo Family Court and the Osaka Family Court. So there are only two competent courts in Japan so that um, judges can obtain uh, expertise and uh, uh, learn more about the Hague Convention and implement it um, promptly, promptly in an efficient way. And uh, um, Japanese courts set up so-called six weeks model so that uh, under the convention, it's um, ideally um, all the return proceedings should be completed within six weeks. And we uh, abide by the time frame uh, in general. So uh, we are doing quite well in that respect and deciding um, properly under the convention. And as I mentioned before, the convention itself has limited grounds for refusal and particularly grave risk exception is handled very cautiously because if we start extending the notion of grave risk that the child should not be returned to the state of habitual residence, then uh, the mechanism of the convention uh, will be uh, will not work out. So this is why we take a very limited uh, interpretation of grave risk. And uh, in addition to that, when there are ameliorative measures in place in the um, state of habitual residence, then uh, we would return the child. So ameliorative measures means, for example, the case of domestic violence, there is a shelter where the mother and the child can stay for the time being until a um, custody issue is resolved in the state of habitual residence. So when this is ensured and the violent father does not um, uh, have access to the mother and the child during that time, then the Japanese judge would uh, render a return order so that uh, the child um, be returned to the state of habitual residence. 
So all these uh, grounds for refusal are handled uh, cautiously and uh, interpreted in a um, restrictive way. The um, particularity of Japanese practice is that we have um, a high percentage of amicable solutions. So it is about 62% of all cases, which is um, um, very high because the average of amicable solutions um, of all contracting states is around 30%. So we have uh, the double the number and, um, and judges and also central authorities officers often encourage parents to reach an agreement to have an uncommon solution because uh, the relationship between parents and the child um, continues even after the child is returned or child is decided to uh, stay in Japan. So this is why it's um, always better to have an amicable solution between the parents so that um, access to the child can be exercised smoothly in the future and uh, parents can cooperate to kick, take care of the child. At the same time, uh, once the return order is rendered, because parents do not reach an agreement and the judge decides that uh, the child be returned to the state of habitual residence, then we should make sure that um, enforcement measures are in place in an efficient way. And this was uh, the biggest challenge we had because we did not have this kind of system before under Japanese uh, family law. So this is why the legislature was very cautious and uh, established two steps of enforcement measures. The first one is to implement monetary sanction. So the taking mother is ordered to pay like um, 100 US dollars or 200 US dollars a day until she gives uh, the child back to the state of habitual residence. And only if uh, the monetary sanction is not successful, then uh, execution by substitute takes place and court behaves and goes directly to the child and get the child to um, hand the child over to be returned to the state of habitual residence. In addition to that, in order not to harm the child during enforcement, the legislature initial, initially um, established the principle that um, there must be simultaneous presence of the taking parent and the child at the site where uh, the direct enforcement takes place. Because uh, when the child is left in an um, unfamiliar environment, then the child might be shocked and uh, may have mental distress. So in order to avoid that, then um, legislature require that the taking parent is also present at the site of enforcement. And unfortunately, this led to problems because um, taking parent <laughs> intentionally avoided to, to be staying with the child when they realized enforcement will be coming. So they just uh, left the child with the grandparents and uh, avoided enforcement. And this kind of problems occurred. So we actually amended our statute already in 2019, five years after joining the convention to abolish this kind of simultaneous presence requirement. And uh, uh, we also allow now to skip the first step of monetary sanctions and go directly to the direct enforcement. Um, in the Japanese practice, it's also important to ensure hearing the child's voice. This is done currently uh, by family court investigation officers and uh, they, um, First play with the child so that the child gets relaxed and then uh, start asking questions whether the child uh, wants to go back to the state of habitual residence and so on. And this um, all occurs within one hour. It's too short and uh, quite often and the hearing of the child's voice is not sufficient. So this is why afterwards when the enforcement um, proceedings is started, uh, then the child's often object to being returned. And after some time elapsed, um, um, until the enforcement measures are taken. So ch child may have also changed uh, his or her uh, mind and then often said, no, I, I want to stay in Japan. So how to ensure hearing the child's voice and uh, uh, find the best solution for the child is a remaining issue that uh, we should improve in Japan in the future. So for future development, um, I think, um, the difficulties we have encountered in Japan due to our domestic family law 
uh, is shared with um, by other Asian countries because we have similar legal systems and we do not have clear cut rights or obligations under our family law. So the experience we made in Japan may encourage other Asian countries to ju to join the convention and. It is something that uh, we can also do and is also a helpful mechanism to ensure the best interests of the child and ensure that uh, the child maintains uh, contact with both parents, even after the marital relationship has broken down. Um, the Japanese legislator uh, will now introduce joint parental responsibility after divorce, finally. So it's um, being in discussion, but ultimately uh, the decisive factor was that the European Parliament adopted a resolution in July 2020 urging Japan to abide by the Hague Convention and also the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we should in introduce and joint parental responsibility after divorce to ensure that the child maintains contact with both parents even after divorce. So um, joining the Hague Convention gave also a um, positive impact, so to say, and to foreign countries. And uh, uh, they are observing how uh, practice uh, is uh, going on in Japan. So this is why that also gave um, an um, inspiration to us to improve our own system. And I think uh, we will continue tackling these issues in Japan. And um, we, we will certainly learn also from the UX experience. And uh, yeah, uh, having discussion in this respect is very important. In this. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Please, Linda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Yuko. Um, I want to just urge uh, everyone, um, she has this wonderful ar article, um, which is available to you, and she will, in that article, she talks about some of this in greater uh, detail, um, and it is really a terrific article, which gives you a real sense of how difficult um, it was in Japan to uh, join this convention. Um, what I want to do is add a, a U.S. perspective, um, and I'm going to do that with respect to a number of points that Professor Nishitani has made. Um, one, the particular problem of the rights of custody um, that she's described so well for Japan. Uh, second, recent developments in the United States with respect to the grave risk defense. And finally, the role of the child's uh, objections. Um, I want to first talk about sort of rights of custody and habitual residence. Um, and to uh, Yuko's description of the custody rights of um, the respective parents upon divorce in many Asian countries, including Japan. So the convention obligation to return a child um, who has been taken across a border turns on whether um, the party um, seeking return has rights of custody within the definition of the convention. And it is defined as rights relating to the care of the person of the child, and in particular, the right to determine the child's place of residence. So mere access or visitation, as we know it, does not trigger the return remedy. But I was particularly interested, and I didn't know about this, um, to learn about this, what you characterize as the clean break um, principle in Japanese law that actually gives parental authority to only one parent. And because it's the law of the habitual residence that applies to the issue of rights of custody, when Japanese law is the law applicable, apparently only one parent will have custody rights within the meaning of the convention. And that parent would then be free to take a child across the border, and there would be no wrongful removal under the convention. So Japanese law could be preserved even with the convention in effect, but one can understand that the obligation to return a child, even when a different applicable law does confer rights of custody on both parents, that that would not seem appropriate um, to the Japanese. So I think it is admirable that Japan was prepared to eventually ratify the convention in 2014. And um, even more interesting is the new legislation in Japan that will confer rights of custody on both parents. That's a really very interesting development. Maybe you'll say more 
about that. But there is a related issue about rights of custody that affects the operation of the convention in many other countries. And that issue arises in situations where one parent is given custody and the other parent has only rights of access. But that access is then combined with a restriction on the custodial parent removing the child from the jurisdiction. So the parent with access now also has something called a nexiate right, the right to prevent the removal of the child. And the question under the convention was whether such a nexiate right should be understood as a right of custody. And numerous courts, including the US Supreme Court in a case called Abbott versus Abbott in 2010, held that it is. In Abbott, the US Supreme Court explained that the exit clauses are usually created by a court order or a statute in the country of habitual residence, and they're designed to ensure that the child remains in that country. And that restriction aligns with the convention's very purpose, which is to have custody disputes decided in the country of the child's habitual residence. And accordingly, if a breach of uh, the exit clause did not give rise to a return remedy, that the convention would be rendered meaningless in many cases where it's most needed. So that was a very important development in uh, the US. Um, I wanna say a word, although you didn't talk much about it, it is talked about in some detail in your paper, and that is this whole concept of habitual residence. And I wanna mention it because the Supreme Court of the United States in a decision in 2020 uh, Monaski versus Taglieri, uh, in opinion by Justice Ginsburg, held that a child's habitual residence depended upon the totality of the circumstances. And that's consistent with the case law in the EU, the UK, and Japan. Um, in Monaski, the issue was the habitual residence of a, an infant child who had lived with the parents in only one country um, before the wrongful removal to the US by the mother. And the court rejected the mother's arguments, but because the child could not have acclimated uh, uh, to um, Italy, and because there was no agreement by the parties, the child had no habitual residence. Uh, Justice Ginsburg referred to acclimatization as a relevant factor with respect to older children and to parental intention as an important consideration for uh, children too young to acclimate. But she stressed the need to examine all the factors. And interestingly, she noted numerous decisions of foreign courts that said, uh, this is a fact-driven uh, inquiry and you have to look at all the particular circumstances. So let me then turn to this grave risk uh, exception that Professor uh, Nishitani highlighted. Um, and it is one of the significant defenses to the return of the child um, in Article 13.1b, and that's the child could be exposed to a grave risk of harm or face an intolerable situation upon return. Now that's a factual question for the court hearing the return application, that is the requested state. But a related issue in these grave risk cases is the ability of a requested state to ameliorate uh, any grave risk by imposing conditions, um, Professor Nishitani referenced this, um, in the order of return to ensure that um, the child will be uh, safe upon return and so therefore not refuse to return the child. There's a very, very recent and very important case in the United States um, just last year, the Golan versus Sada decision. Um, and there the U.S. Supreme Court addressed a narrower but a specific point of whether a court must consider the role of protective measures before re re refusing return. In Golan, the American mother and Italian father had been living in Italy when the mother brought her young child to the U.S. and wrongfully retained the child here. In response to the husband's petition for return, the mother said she had been uh, subject to continuous acts of domestic violence and those had been witnessed by the child. Um, and the district court, uh, hearing expert testimony, determined that there were acts of domestic violence and a grave risk to the child if returned, but then proceeded to determine uh, to see if ameliorative measures could be imposed in connection with the return of the child and that that could eliminate the risk. So initially, the district court 
uh, determined that certain undertakings, when I say undertakings, I mean sort of agreements on the part of the husband uh, to stay away from the wife and to pay certain expenses, that that would alleviate the grave risk. But on appeal, the Court of Appeals concluded that those undertakings were not necessarily enforceable in Italy, so they were inadequate. Um, and it remanded the case to determine if there were ways to impose protective measures that an Italian court would enforce. And so on remand, it was arranged to have orders issued by the Italian court that would keep the husband away from the wife, to have supervised visitation, to uh, have counseling mandated for the father and some other things. Um, and with those orders in place in Italy, the district court ordered return, the Court of Appeals affirmed. The Supreme Court granted Ms. Golan's petition for certiorari, which raised um, a very, very technical point that the district court had relied upon Second Circuit precedent that required a court to consider ameliorative measures before denying return. The petitioner argued that the convention opposed no such requirement, and her position was supported by the U.S. government that came in as an amicus. I filed my own amicus brief taking the opposite position, emphasizing that to require a court to consider ameliorative measures did not mean that a court should necessarily adopt such measures in order to affect the return. Court always has discretion to find that the um, protective measures are uh, insufficient to eliminate the grave risk and can order, um, refuse to order return of the child. Um, we argued um, in um, that uh, amicus brief that I did with uh, Professor Tights uh, as well, um, that a rule mandating a court to at least consider such measures would offer clear guidance as to the steps a court should engage in when hearing uh, an application for uh, return. In support of that position, our amicus brief referenced the Hague Conference Guide to Good Practice for Article 13 1b, which states, in cases where the taking parent has established circumstances involving domestic violence that would amount to a grave risk to the child, court should consider, I emphasize, should consider the availability, adequacy, and effectiveness of measures protecting the child. Um, and we also noted that the EU regulations, both the Brussels 2 bis and the recent 2022 Brussels uh, to tear, which apply to intra-European abduction, provide that a member state cannot refuse to return a child under the Hague Abduction Convention if it is established that adequate arrangements have been made to secure the protection of the child after his or her return. The Supreme Court, in a unanimous opinion by Justice Sotomayor, held that neither the text of the convention nor the U.S. implementing legislation, ICARA, requires the consideration of ameliorative measures. According, the court concluded that whether or not to consider ameliorative measures in the context of this great risk defense is a matter of discretion. And at the same time, Justice Sotomayor emphasized that, and I quote her, discretion is not whim. And so she noted that a court has no obligation uh, to consider ameliorative measures that have not been raised by the parties. But she then said a court should ordinarily address those measures when raised by the parties or suggested by uh, the circumstances. So I read this as supporting uh, more generally the use of ameliorative measures, um, although our position was not expressly adopted. Indeed, one could say it was rejected. Um, but she then added certain principles that should guide a court in exercising that discretion. So she said you uh, should not use them where the risk is so great, where they wouldn't work or where the, they would not be followed. Um, they, such measures should only relate to ones that would permit safe return and not dealing with more uh, permanent kinds of arrangements that were for the court at the habitual residence. And they ought not to extend the proceedings to cause undue delay. As Professor Nishitani said, this is supposed to be relatively quick and sometimes uh, using all of this can extend uh, the proceedings. Uh, the case was then remanded um, to the district court in order for it to engage in that discretionary um, inquiry. And let me then just uh, go to the objection of the child to return. So uh, another point 
that Professor uh, Nishitani made is the growing significance of the role of the child's objection with respect to return. And Article 13 permits a requested state to refuse to the return of the child if it finds that the child objects to being returned and has attained an age and degree of maturity at which it is appropriate to take account of its views. So that inquiry will occur, occur during the summary return proceedings and courts in the various contracting state take different approaches with respect to how to uh, ascertain the child's views. And courts differ as to what age a child should be in order to hear the child or, and or what weight uh, to give to a child's view. Um, the more recent phenomenon has uh, emerged, and it's one that Professor Nishitani uh, mentioned in her discussion uh, here, um, and that is either modifying a return order due to a child's continuing objections or refusing to enforce an order because of the child's uh, objections. Um, and I think, um, Yuko, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but I found this in your article and I had not been aware of the provision in the Implementation Act that permits a return order to be modified in light of changed circumstances. I don't know if that is still uh, the rule or whether it changed in the more recent um, amendment, but it appears that the continuing objections of the child, even if rejected as a basis for non-return in the hearing, can result in a modification of the return order. And in your article, you mentioned a couple of cases. They seem um, uh, very unusual um, in the sense that one was a uh, 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 an in-court conciliation agreement where maybe the child uh, wasn't heard and the other where they separated siblings. But nonetheless, um, my view is, and I'd be interested in your reaction, that the consideration of the child's view at the sort of enforcement or execution stage potentially undermine the entire Hague return uh, proceeding. And there are other recent examples of non-enforcement of an order, and you and I talked about this, um, uh, for example, from Korea, which uh, has led the United States this year to identify Korea uh, as a, a non-compliant country, because in one case, the Supreme Court of Korea had actually confirmed, um, upheld the order for return of the children to the United States, um, and the mother continued to move about to avoid execution of the order. And when she was finally found, at least as I understand it, the children who were five and three expressed their intention to live with the mother and the bailiff would not enforce uh, the order. I, I gather that the reform of the Implementation Act um, to facilitate execution of return um, is an important step. Um, and as a result, I think Japan, which was once on the list of non-compliant countries, was uh, taken uh, off of it. Um, I'll just make one other quick uh, comment before I close. And that was something that you emphasized about concentrated jurisdiction in particular courts in Japan. I think um, that's a very attractive feature because you've got jurisdiction in what the family courts of Tokyo and uh, Osaka, and the result is to be able to marshal judicial expertise in these cases. And I think, as you know, there's no such concentration of jurisdiction in the United States. The implementation legislation in the United States um, and ICARA, the International Child Abductions Remedy Act, provides that the court authorized to exercise jurisdiction is the one in the place where the child is located at the time the petition is filed. And we're a very big country. Um, the result uh, is that courts uh, with jurisdiction over that place will hear the return petition. And because there's concurrent jurisdiction under the statute, um, the application or return can be filed in either the state or federal court, and that's many states uh, or federal courts. Um, if it's brought in state court, the defendant can remove um, the case to federal court. But the uh, concurrent jurisdiction in the state and federal courts and the broad number of courts that have authority means that Hague cases can come before any one of a vast number of judges, many of whom are not familiar with the convention and may confront only a single such case in their judicial careers. And so that I think is uh, somewhat uh, an unfortunate uh, situation that we have uh, in the United States. And with that, um, let me close and uh, turn it back uh, to Yuko or to Catherine. Thank you so much, Linda. 
Um, may I perhaps make two comments uh, following uh, Professor Silberman's presentation? My first um, point is about the rights of custody under the convention. And, uh, and the second point is a child's objection. So first of all, um, as uh, Professor Silberman rightly pointed out, that um, uh, whether the um, convention applies and whether the return uh, shall be ordered because uh, the uh, rights of custody of the left behind parent has been breached or not, uh, is determined according to the law of the habitual residence of the child. So when the uh, U.S. case, a uh, child is abducted from the U.S. to Japan, then we would apply the respective uh, law of the state in the United States to see whether rights are of custody, the left behind parents um, have been breached or not. So in that respect, uh, in order to apply the convention, it's not relevant whether Japan has um, joint um, parental uh, responsibility after divorce or not. But what has become an issue with Germany, France, and Italy, because these um, you know, German uh, French fathers lost their children because Japanese mother took the children back to Japan, was that they could not have any kind of contact with the child at all. So not only uh, could they get uh, children back, returned um, to their uh, state of habitual residence, but also uh, there could be no um, access order granted by the Japanese courts. So there were uh, no way for these uh, fathers to have um, uh, any kind of conduct with the children. So this is why uh, reforming our domestic law to introduce joint parental authority after divorce would also change our perception <laughs> that uh, even after divorce, both parents shall be engaged in care of the, of the child and access to the child shall be guaranteed. So uh, I think in that respect, we can uh, see some improvement in the near future. My second point is... Um, about uh, the child's objection. I fully agree with Professor Silberman that if we start looking at child's objection, uh, which can um, change any time for you know, the child at the age of 10 and, and, and said sometimes, oh, I want to return to the US or I want to stay in Japan and so on. And if we should uh, readily change a return order according to the child's intent, that would be really problematic. So I fully agree with that. Uh, the problem we have in Japan is, however, first of all, family court investigation officer hears the child only for one hour <laughs> and uh, decides whether the child objects or not. And that's obviously not sufficient. And uh, we would probably need a guardian ad litem, like in other countries, to have a third person who is a social worker or an attorney uh, who can explain the uh, convention's mechanism and the entire situation to the child as a neutral person to make the child understand um, what it means to go back to the state of habitual residence. And the, the uh, return of the child is never final because it only means that the courts of the um, state of habitual residence render a custody decision. And it may well be that the taking parent um, obtains custody rights and child may remain in Japan afterwards. So uh, if the child better understands the entire situation, I think um, child's objection um, would be alleviated and the entire situation will be better. So I think um, I mentioned that um, uh, as a, you know, as a point where we should improve our practice in Japan. Thank you so much. So thank you both so much for these really um, detailed and um, uh, detailed discussions of where the problems lie. I want to invite the audience to jump in with your questions. Um, so the question from an anonymous uh, audience member is, uh, Linda mentioned proclamations by state parties that another state is not in compliance. Is this anticipated by the convention? And if so, with what consequence? It is not, it is not uh, mentioned in the convention. Um, I think the State Department uh, has put up uh, this um, this list. Um, Yuko, you may know even more about this because Japan was once on this list and now it isn't. Don, um, 
to my knowledge, it's uh, only the United States that uh, makes a list of uh, non-compliant countries, and uh, that includes also non-contracting states. So that gives some, you know, um, incentive for, for these countries to join the convention. And I think uh, it's good. Actually, uh, I did research on the practice in Germany, and the, they were listed as a non-compliant country for 20 years. <laughs> and that ultimately gave an um, incentive for the Ger German legislature to improve their enforcement measures. Uh, and after that reform, uh, Germany was taken down from the non-compliant list. So I think uh, it, is, uh, it is good. <laughs> Thank you. So, Professor Nishitani, I'm guessing that there are more custody disputes between Japanese citizens and citizens of neighboring countries in Asia than there are between Japanese citizens and Americans. You mentioned some of the numbers at the beginning of your remarks about the cases involving uh, American uh, partners. So, for example, mainland China is not a signatory to the Hague Convention, but it's Right next door to Japan, there are many trade and, and other contacts between the two countries. So I'm guessing that these circumstances arise there. How are they currently being addressed? And do you happen to know uh, whether those cases take longer to resolve generally than the ones that are being handled according to the convention? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we do have uh, custody cases with neighboring countries uh, like China and South Korea, as you mentioned. But uh, the thing is, both Japan and mainland China have consensual divorce, and many cases are uh, uh, resolved uh, without coming to courts. So this is why we, we do not notice what is really going on. And even if a case is brought to the Japanese courts, um, depending on the nationality of the parties, we apply either Japanese law or Chinese law. And uh, uh, when Chinese law is applicable, they do not have the concept of parental responsibility, but only custody to take care of the child. And that's granted by the Japanese courts, often to the mother. So uh, I do not think uh, that raises particular issues in that respect. But um, I'm also aware of child abduction cases from Japan to mainland China. And um, because mainland China is not yet party to the uh, Hague Convention, uh, there is no way for the Japanese parent of getting the child back. So that's uh, really a problem. And uh, what I heard is that the um, Chinese government is also contemplating to join the Hague Child Abduction Convention. So there is already an agreement between mainland China and Hong Kong, uh, similar to the uh, Hague Child Abduction Convention. And if they find out that it works out well, then uh, we could expect that mainland China may also join the Hague Convention, which is uh, advantageous to other countries as well. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to read another uh, audience question. Uh, greetings from Hiroshima, uh, says William Cleary. And he asks, is there uh, any movement in Japan to help domestic couples to deal with this problem between Japanese couples? So I, it sounds like he's asking about a um, custody dispute that's entirely domestic. Mm -hmm. For domestic cases, uh, yes. Um, under our current case law, unfortunately, if marriage breaks down and the mother takes the child and goes back to uh, her parents uh, without the father's consent, um, there is no way for the father of getting uh, the child back. Uh, because it's considered as a legal act, and particularly if the mother was the primary caregiver, it's also considered appropriate for the mother to take, to take, take care of the child. But um, because our legislature is contemplating reform, and once um, joint parental responsibility is introduced, even after divorce, then um, we will also um, think about you know, uh, a similar mechanism like the Hague Convention for domestic cases, the child be returned to the father more readily. So that will occur in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then um, we have a question from Bruce Aronson, who's the senior advisor to our 
a Japan Center at the U.S. Asia Law Institute. So, Bruce, I'd like to invite you to turn on your camera and your and your mic and ask your question directly. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Can you, you can hear me okay? Uh, Yuko and Linda, yes. thank you for a wonderful, uh, stimulating um, conversation. Uh, I think my question relates to sort of the parallels between um, joint custody or joint parental responsibility within Japan domestically and some of the issues that might arise under the convention. In particular, I was interested in the, my impression that women's rights groups in Japan tend to oppose both joint custody and, and return of children, for example, to American fathers. Uh, my understanding is that viewpoint is based on um, that the issues we've been talking about are not as important to women as the more basic issues of domestic violence and the low levels and lack of compliance with both alimony and child support. Um, and so um, I was a bit surprised to hear this, uh, but that's my understanding. So could you talk about that? And uh, uh, would it really be necessary to pick one or the other or not focus on the convention and, and, and joint parental responsibility because of the need to focus more on domestic violence and payment um, to divorced wives. I'm not sure why we have to pick one or the other, but I was surprised to hear that there were women's rights groups who were actively opposing some of these measures. Could you comment on that, please? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, insightful question. Um, I think um, we can distinguish uh, between uh, Hague Convention cases and domestic cases. So for Hague um, cases, it's an issue whether uh, we can return the child and ask the taking Japanese mother to go back to the U.S. where she was living. And although the husband uh, was violent towards the mother and then... Uh, and, as uh, uh, Professor Silberman mentioned, uh, there is a grave risk exception under the convention. So if the child uh, was directly abused by the father, or if the child observed the mother being beaten by the father and had mental disorder because of that, then um, this constitutes grounds for refusal under the convention as well. So we have um, a major or mechanism to protect the child in such a kind of situation. And um, as for mothers, and domestic violence is a big issue, but um, it needs to be uh, handled in the state of habitual residence. So when uh, there are um, ameliorate measures in place and the mother can be safely uh, staying in a shelter for the time being until a custody decision is rendered by the courts there, then um, I think there is no problem of uh, returning the mother in that respect for international cases. For domestic cases, uh, there is a big debate whether uh, we should introduce joint parental uh, responsibility after divorce or not, um, precisely because of uh, domestic violence cases. So um, in quite a um, number of cases in Japan, mothers suffer from uh, domestic violence by the father, and there is the, um, the only way to get out of the house and take the child to escape from domestic violence. And this is because we do not have any uh, effective and coercive measures to, to protect the mother in such a domestic violence case under domestic law. And that's the problem. And the uh, women's movements say that uh, under current situation, if we should introduce a joint parental responsibility after divorce, then the father uh, would continue intervening into life and of the poor mother, and although she has no protection. And that's an, a problematic point um, we are discussing. But again, um, even if we should introduce joint parental authority and uh, responsibility after divorce, it does not mean that uh, it should apply to all cases, but it will be limited to non-problematic cases where parents agree and can cooperate to take care of the child after divorce. So in you know extreme domestic violence cases, it will be certainly excluded. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask what, what may wind up being uh, the last question because we are coming close to time. I'm wondering whether there have been in the 
it's almost a, a decade now since um, the convention began to be implemented in uh, Japan. So there's been a fairly good length of time to have the experience. Have there been in this period of time any uh, controversial cases involving implementation of the convention that may have caused um, society or you know, experts who are involved in the field to have any doubts about having joined the convention? Or has all of the experience and the feedback from that experience been positive? Um, I'll just say a couple of words quickly. Um, and President Ishitani referenced this. I mean, there have been very strong objections to the convention on by a group of sort of women, to pick up on Bruce's point, um, who um, really believe that the convention um, perpetuates sort of domestic violence and notwithstanding um, the grave risk, um, they do not believe um, that you should return a child at all, ameliorative measures not, when there are strong allegations of domestic violence. Women are leaving, if you will, uh, for that. And there is a very strong uh, lobby group that is looking for to a protocol um, to the uh, convention. And I think you know, my own view of this has gotten quite out of hand, but um, we'll see what happens. There's a special commission coming up. I think Professor Nishitani will be there and she'll be able to uh, tell us a little bit more. Um, and the other issue which is um, uh, has come up is the uh, role of the child's objections. And again, Professor Nishitani knows a great deal about that as well, because there have been um, decisions by the European uh, Court of Human Rights that has uh, sort of given a much stronger role uh, to the child, um, the, the child's objections um, in these cases. Um, once again, um, you know, there are all sorts of um, questions about the influence of the taking parent on the child uh, in terms of what it says. And as Professor Nishitani said, all they really are supposed to be doing is sending the child back to the habitual residence, and that is the court that is supposed to sort all this out, listen to the child's objections about who they want to live with um, and uh, who should get custody and so on. So, Professor Nishitani, would you like to say a few more words on that? Oh, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I think, um, the the wording in Japanese and uh, parental responsibility actually says parental authority, and we have been discussing it from the viewpoints of parents so far, and uh, the movement in Europe and the U.S. that we should you know put child in the center and think about what is the best for the child is a very important perception which should be also implemented in Japan. So from that perspective, I think we should have you know more respect for a child's voice. At the same time, we should also um, think about better mechanism like you know introducing a um, guardian ad litem to better understand what the child really wants to you know, realize a situation that is the best for the child. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Okay. Mm. So uh, now I, we are at time, so I want to be respectful of that and, um, and draw us to a close. But thank you both, uh, Professors Nishitani and Silberman, for sharing your insights with us. It's been a fantastic discussion and a really educational hour for all of us. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for, your, uh, for attending. And uh, keep an eye out for our uh, coming uh, speaker events, we have another next week, and there'll be more over the course of this fall semester. Thank you all, and goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.